guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetrabit Gaming, the series where we explore the unused, altered, and unseen content in gaming. It's been a few months since my previous LEGO Star Wars video, but we are back today to cover probably one of the best LEGO games out there, LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. Well, I guess it's the not-so-complete saga now. Now, although this game is like a pseudo-remake of the first two games in the series, there's actually quite a bit in this game in the unused content department. So let's get to it, slash up that like button, let's head back to the toy galaxy far far away, and find some more Lost Bits. Alright, so to start, there are a whole bunch of unused levels left over unused in most versions of the complete saga. Now, just like in my previous videos on this series, in the interest of time, I'll be skipping over some unused rooms with less notable differences, and I'll just be focusing on some of the more interesting ones. But as always, if you'd like to see all of them, head on over to Linterny Gamer's video, which I'll have linked for you down in the description. Anyways, firstly, there's a leftover early version of the main hub cantina area. There are several versions of it left over, but we'll be focusing on the one with the most changes listed as Gym Test A. It's mostly the same here, but there are a few changes to note. For starters, the doors don't function properly, and in the Episode 1 room, there's actually a portrait of Qui-Gon Jinn instead of R2-D2, as is seen in the final release. Since R2 is seen in pretty much every episode, I think giving Qui-Gon a bit of a spotlight in this room would have been a really nice touch. Furthermore, there are cups thrown all over the place, and even floating mid-air. I guess maybe someone is practicing using the Force or something. Many of the icons at the shop appear to be early placeholders, and as you can see, Collision is also kinda bonkers here. The outside court area here is also much less finished, as some objects seen in the final version are lacking. There is no door here yet to open to find the little cart thing, so I guess that must have been a later addition. And then the force field here also doesn't have the models for the things that emit it, and the control panel is also missing a few parts as well. But probably the most interesting difference in this early stage, however, is the existence of this hat seen hanging above the entrance to this door. And this hat is, of course, the iconic one belonging to none other than Indiana Jones. Now we'll come back to this more in a bit, but although Indy did end up being an unlockable character in the complete saga, this hat being above this door suggests that this might have once been planned to be the entrance to a bonus preview level of LEGO Indiana Jones, which was the next LEGO game to be released after this one. Then next, following Gym Test A, naturally we got Gym Test B, and as you can obviously see, this appears to be an early version of the Anakin's Flight level that was reimagined in this game after being scrapped from the original LEGO Star Wars game as we covered in my previous video. Anyways, this early version isn't exactly something one would consider complete, or nice to look at. There's no skybox, no enemies or items, and a severe lack of textures almost everywhere. That said though, at least it still plays relatively okay. Then similarly to this, there's also an early version of the Coruscant chase stage that too was reimagined from LEGO Star Wars 1 here, listed as Luke Test. Now, despite featuring the name of the series' main protagonist, this stage likely doesn't have anything to do with Luke Skywalker at all, but rather was made by Luke Giddings, who worked on developing this game. This early version is much darker, and there aren't any arrow indicators telling you where to go, making it much easier to get lost here. And yeah, it definitely doesn't look nearly as good as it does in the final version. Next up, also from Attack of the Clones, is Jedi Intro 360, and honestly, it looks a lot more like Rainbow Road from Mario Kart. Now obviously, the textures aren't working properly in this cutscene, and when it switches to the actual gameplay, it breaks even more, as almost every background object becomes impossible to see. Now based on the name and just how broken it gets, it's thought that this may have literally just been this stage ported from the GameCube version of LEGO Star Wars 1 to be developed and implemented into the Xbox 360 version of the complete saga. Then on a similar note, literally just discovered as I was making this video are a whole bunch more unused maps found in the Xbox 360 version of this game. Now unfortunately, most of these new unused maps that were found either didn't have any notable changes or caused the game to crash, but there are two of them that are at least of some note, two Negotiations A, as well as two Rescue Intro 4. 
In addition to the brightness and contrast just appearing off here, since both of these stages are literally just ported over from LEGO Star Wars 1 into the level format that the Xbox 360 version uses, they are slightly broken and some objects are missing too. Next, there's Live Prelight as well as Bonus Gunship, both which appear to be unfinished versions of both the Gunship Cavalry stages you can play in this game. Live Prelight just seems to be lacking a proper skybox in the background, and since the second, original Gunship Cavalry stage you unlock was from the original LEGO Star Wars, this too appears to be broken due to it likely being ported over from the first LEGO Star Wars game. Then moving on to unused stages from Episode 3, next is the first of many really interesting unused test stages, here simply listed as Char Test, or I guess Care Test, as this appears to be a character test map. Kinda similar to how we saw in my video on LEGO Star Wars 2, this map basically functions as a playground of sorts to test how the characters control. But instead of in a more traditional basic stage like we normally see here on the show, this one instead takes place in the map where you fight General Grievous in the game. There's a gaggle of stormtroopers as well as battle droids here that don't attack you immediately, so these were probably just here to test combat mechanics. There are several vehicle types here that you can hop in, including one of them fancy standing speeders, a walker, a catapult, and an orange cart. It's kinda strange they would use these to test the vehicle mechanics in this map, seeing as how there's like no room to really drive around. So if anything, I guess maybe the focus was more on the ability of the characters to just enter and exit these vehicles. Then there's also a switch that doesn't seem to really do anything, and finally, my favorite part, just like we saw in LEGO Star Wars 2, there's this device that gives the character a disguise. But unlike before, where it would just give you a Stormtrooper mask or something, this one actually gives you Indiana Jones's iconic hat. It's a nice little nod to the game that would be coming up next in the LEGO video game series. Then, once again, using the same area is the map John Test. Here we not only once again see a bunch of the same vehicles, but also some new ones like this big old fire truck. What, you don't remember the scene from Star Wars with the fire truck? Well, this truck is seen in the game in the unlockable town stage, but it kinda just looks goofy here. This stage also has more of the disguise machines as well as the interactable panels that require a certain character to access. So with all of these, it appears that character interactability was the major focus of testing in this test room. Furthermore, although not 100% confirmed, since John here is spelled J-O-H-N, and there's only one person credited in this game with that spelling, it's almost certain that this is a room put together by John Hodgkinson, the game's lead programmer. Now next up, finally with a change of scenery, and moving on to the original trilogy is Mike Test, and this is a test stage that takes place in Moss Eisley. Immediately, we can see that this is an unfinished version of Moss Eisley, as the lighting is completely different to how it's seen in the final version. And once again, we've got quite a few things here that we've already seen in past test stages. We got more docile stormtroopers, more disguise machines, which here give the player either Princess Leia's hairdo or a really spiffy top hat. And then for some things we haven't seen in the test stages yet, this one also has several buildables, objects that Jedi and Sith characters can use the Force to move, the camera system used for the disguise mechanic, as well as a turnstile thing that works to open up this door here. And interestingly enough, although a single-sided one is seen, this turnable thing with two handles was never actually implemented into the game. Now, unlike we saw with John Test, there are several Mikes or Michaels that programmed or worked in QA for this game, so it's really hard to pinpoint who made this stage. Now, I mentioned a few similar test things to LEGO Star Wars 2, but none are as similar as the test map simply just titled Test. This map is actually almost a complete copy of a test stage from LEGO Star Wars 2, with the only exception here being that several stormtroopers were added and scattered all over the place. Unfortunately, not really anything else here that I haven't already covered either in my previous video or in this one. Then next up is Glyn Moss C, a word mixture of Glyn Scrag, who was a programmer for this game, as well as Moss Eisley. And yes, we're back at Moss Eisley, but this time inside the cantina where a bunch of lasers are shot at you by... ghosts? 
yeah, here the lasers just appear to come out of nowhere. It's honestly pretty weird. Then, guess what? We got yet another test map, this time titled Jez Test, and here, in addition to the same vehicle set we've seen in prior maps, there's also some flowers, some basket things, as well as several cubes in different sizes. And there's also this rope that the player can use to swing between these two blocks. Now apparently, this test map was very likely used to test object data that was later on used in LEGO Indiana Jones, as well as LEGO Batman. Then, very similarly, there's also Anim Test, which takes place in a less than textured area. Here too, we can see a few mechanics that aren't present in the final build of this game, but were seen in later releases, including swimming, as well as the ability to pick up and carry objects. It's pretty cool to see that the developers were already working on stuff for future games before this game was even finished. And lastly, and probably the most notable of all the unused levels in this game, is Helen Test 2, likely named after Helen Kershaw, one of the lead animators of this game. And this stage actually appears to be an early version of the Lost Temple stage from LEGO Indiana Jones. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but let's crack into it now. So basically, there are a few things left over in LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga, such as the LEGO Indiana Jones hat above the door I mentioned earlier, as well as a scrapped character we'll come back to later, that suggest that at one point in development, the plan was to feature a bonus stage in the game, where players would get a sneak peek into the LEGO Indiana Jones game, which was upcoming at the time. Pretty much like how in the original LEGO Star Wars game, players could unlock a teaser stage of the intro to Star Wars Episode IV. Now ultimately, apparently due to the developers not being able to get permission to include a level of this nature in the game, just a trailer for LEGO Indiana Jones was added in the bonus room instead. Anyways, back to the Helen test stage, we can see that although it looks somewhat developed, there are still several objects that appear to lack proper textures, collision is pretty wonky in some parts, and stuff like the water here isn't even visible, so this stage definitely wasn't finished. Although this map is pretty short, just like the teaser stage in the original LEGO Star Wars game, something like this would have been awesome to include in the game and definitely would have gotten more people hyped for the Indiana Jones game, at least more than just a trailer and Indy as an unlockable character. Additionally, there's also a very much unfinished cutscene meant for this level found kicking around in the files as well. Wow, that was not only a lot of unused levels, but a lot of unused test stages to boot. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know I love me my test stages, so it was really cool to see so many of them here, and they were all pretty interesting too. Next up, there's actually an unused item that was discovered in the game only recently. Now I don't know how to describe this thing, but to me it looks like some sort of remote control device or something. Now when picked up by a character, it acts just like the regular power-up orb, so it's thought that maybe the power-up orbs were planned to initially look like this, which honestly I think would have looked way more unique than just an orb. Next up, let's talk unused audio stuff. First up, heard in the unused early versions of the Cantina are otherwise unheard audio tracks from Dexter's Diner. The diner was the hub area in the first LEGO Star Wars game, so it kinda makes sense why they'd reuse the track here in the cantina as a placeholder until a proper track was added. And then, related to the scrapped Indiana Jones stage, there are also several unused audio files associated with it that have been left over in the game too. Now, unfortunately, playing these here would absolutely get this video copyright claim, so if you'd like to listen to them, I'll kindly direct you to the Cutting Room Floor site, which I'll have linked for you in my sources down in the description below. Now, moving on, let's talk unused graphics. This game has it all, from leftover graphics from the demo version of LEGO Star Wars 2, to a debug font set, to leftover basic looking placeholder button graphics for the PlayStation Wii version, as well as even more basic looking buttons for the original Xbox. Oh, and there's also this default texture that tells you exactly what it is. And lastly, and I think most interesting for the unused graphics, are several storyboard images from LEGO Batman. 
Here we can see Catwoman securing a gem after a heist, getting spotted by a searchlight, and then hopping and flipping to escape from presumably the Gotham Museum. And this cutscene actually did get developed in the LEGO Batman game, almost exactly how it was drawn here, with the only exception being Catwoman only jumping across one rooftop instead of many, which I guess, yeah, is more realistic. In any case, I think it's pretty cool that these were left over here at least a year before LEGO Batman's release. Next, in my previous videos on LEGO Star Wars, we covered a super nifty debug menu that offered a lot of cool functionality, from warping to a level, to unlocking everything in the game with the press of a button. Now, unfortunately, this debug menu hasn't been found in the complete saga, but there are still at least a few debug features that are found kicking around. These include flickering the player's coordinate information, displaying which level is being loaded in, as well as a simple FPS counter. Yay. Yeah, certainly not the most interesting debug features that are left over, especially relative to what we've seen in the previous LEGO Star Wars games, but I suppose something is better than nothing, right? And last up for this video, just like in the other LEGO Star Wars games I covered, the Complete Saga is no exception when it comes to having a whole bunch of unused character data. First off, the unused Boga from LEGO Star Wars 1 returns here once again, this time sporting a nice navy color. For those that haven't seen my first video, you should check it out. There was a Boga chase stage that was scrapped from the first LEGO Star Wars game, so it's kinda strange to see this fella make it all the way into this game, and still looking as unfinished as ever, too. Then more unused characters that have at least some playable data include a scarred Anakin, the bartender guy from the cantina, the spider droid seen in Jabba's palace, Gasgano, I think that's how you say it, the pod racer who uh, doesn't look very finished here, the ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi, General Veers, this medic fella, the Kamino droids, a model simply known as Lightsaber, which is just a model of Mace Windu with a lightsaber going right through his... Uh, then there's Mahonic, Mon Calamari, Luke Skywalker as seen in the start and end of Episode 4, Pilot Padme who uh, doesn't have a hairpiece that was meant for a scrapped cutscene all the way back from the first LEGO Star Wars game, Yoda Chair, the waitress droid from LEGO Star Wars 1, as well as several other characters that may or may not lack animation data for being playable. Next, there's also a scrapped blue Naboo Starfighter that was likely meant to be used for playing co-op with a friend to help differentiate who is controlling which fighter. I guess this was cut since I don't think there are any Starfighters from Naboo that are ever seen in the color blue. And lastly, there are three more unused characters that are particularly of note. First, once again, back as an unused character for the third LEGO Star Wars game in a row is the Spaceman. This character was once planned to be added in way back in the first game, and yeah, even up until this one, the developers never did end up adding him in. Interestingly, the texture for the Spaceman's body ended up among the others seen in the game's character customizer, so it looks like they got pretty dang close to adding him in this time around. I think it's really too bad he wasn't added, because this would have been a really cool reference to LEGO's past with their older sets. Then next, oddly, is an unused character listed as Sans Sweet. And this actually isn't a character seen in Star Wars at all, but based on the name and likeness, it's likely this character was modeled after Steve Sansweet, the president of Rancho Obi-Wan, a Star Wars museum home to the world's largest collection of Star Wars... stuff. It's currently unclear why this character was made. Was he friends with some of the developers and this was some sort of inside joke? Were they actually just gonna model him into the game because of his large collection of Star Wars stuff? Currently, it's not publicly known, but hey, who wouldn't want to be an official character in a LEGO Star Wars game? And lastly, to wrap a nice bow on all of the unused Indiana Jones stuff, there's a scrapped Hovito Tribesman character that was planned to be seen and playable as the second character in the Indiana Jones teaser level that, as we discussed, was also scrapped from this game. Once again, I think it's really too bad this character wasn't implemented alongside the teaser level, but still really cool that the developers left him kicking around so he could still be at least somewhat modded in to be playable. 
And my friends, that'll wrap things up for LEGO Star Wars The Not-So-Complete Saga, and I hope you enjoyed. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Linturney Gamer, who was incredibly helpful with making this video possible. Also, I know in previous videos, many of you mentioned in the comments other LEGO games that you'd like to see me cover. So yeah, keep letting me know which ones you'd like to see, and maybe I'll circle back to them sometime in the future. Till then, check out some of my other Lost Bits videos, and be sure to subscribe to the channel to find your way back in the future. And as always, thank you so much for stopping by, and I will see you in a bit.